Thank you to the CMR for having me today. So I'm Vivian Paxinas. I'm the CEO of a company called Albright. Hopefully lots of you know Albright. We are a global career network for women with one mission to remove barriers for women in the workplace. Um, I'm really excited uh, for this panel today. I've got a chance to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with each of the panelists. We've bonded over shoulder pads, um, their love for oysters, horse racing, amongst lots of other things. So it should be a very exciting discussion. So today's discussion is all around purpose, purpose-led organizations, and how do we, how do we manage the trade-offs, if there are trade-offs between performance and values, and what does that look like? What does that mean? Can you be both purpose-driven and profitable? So I strongly believe that purpose and profit can coexist. I'm very passionate about talking about mission and capital. You know, they are not mutually exclusive. Albright is a perfect example of that. You know, we have a very, very strong purpose, which is our one goal to remove barriers for women in the workplace. But we are proud to do that in the manner that drives commercial success. And I believe the only way to drive change is to empower women economically. So I will keep championing that every single day. Can I ask the audience here, can I get a raise if you believe, raise your hands if you believe you work for a purpose-led organization? Right, good start. <laughs> um, so in, in recent years, we've seen that the concept of purpose has gained significant, significant a lot of traction in, uh, in business. Purpose-driven companies are redefining their approach to management and decision-making. And the shift is being embraced not only by employees, but also by consumers which in some, sometimes also leads to purpose washing for some, um, from a marketing point of view. So if purpose is so important, what does it look like? How do leaders balance commercial and social priorities? For me, purpose means having meaning in my life. It means being a purpose-led leader, leading with empathy, empathy, being intentional about my leadership, and the work that I do has meaning. So let's dive right in. And I'm, uh, I'm giving you a heads up, this is an interactive panel, so you will have some homework throughout the session, and you'll have to chat amongst yourselves. Uh, but I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves first. Oh, just who we are. Who you are, ah, and maybe okay. a quick sentence of what does purpose mean to you? Uh, okay. Um, quick. I'm Dr. Victoria <laughs> Hearth. I'm an independent uh, academic. I work across academia and practice focused on how to align organizations with a sustainable future and have done that for very concertedly the last 20 years, focusing on purpose, governance, marketing, leadership, and culture as the way to do it. I'll go into my definition yes, as part of what yeah, I say yeah. later. Yeah. Um, I'm Kevin Shinklin. I'm a member of the House of Lords. I focus on equality of opportunity. And for me, purpose is about tangible outcomes. It's about measuring progress. It's not about simply policies, procedures, and practices. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Digesting it. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Maggie Buggy. I'm Chief Operating Officer at a company called Normative. Uh, we are a Series B backscale uh, SaaS scale-up focusing on climate tech, getting the world to net zero, one company at a time. I'm uh, also not Executive Director at Sparring Communications List in the FTSE. And, uh, and previously, I was running a major units at SAP globally, Capgemini and uh, Fujitsu. Thank you, Maggie. I'll talk about purpose. Again. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Caroline Whitehead. I am the managing director and co-founder of the Zebra Partnership. Think of uh, the Olympic rings, one, two, three, four, five. It's publishing, events, campaigns. That's where the purpose sits in. Marketing and PR and media. And um, basically what purpose means to me is the passion. It's getting the message across and leaving a legacy. So we all have a different, different definition of purpose. Um, so I'm just going to start with you, Victoria, obviously with so much academic research um, that you've done. How do you define purpose? Is purpose here to stay? And if so, why? Yeah, thanks. And academia is part of it. But really, I only went into academia to, to, to make change in the real world. And I do a lot of my, my work there. So I hope... What I'm trying to do is be a spokesperson for what I think that we're all saying. And if we listen to what was talked about this morning, it's there everywhere. Something is trying to be born. Uh, and the reason why purpose is not going away is because I do believe what's trying to be born is purpose. Now, we can call it sausage, we can call it whatever we want. It is what it is. And I think we have something in the word purpose. So um, the reason it's not going away is because purpose is... Well, the reason we're talking about it is it is a solution to a problem. And that problem is unsustainability. 
And what do we mean by unsustainability? Well, if we take the Brundtland definition and we reword what it is in there, and we often forget this, the goal of sustainability is well-being, not just any old thing, for everyone, not just a few, and over the long term, not just now. Long term, well-being for all people and planet. Now, that happens to also be the definition of the goal of a functioning, effective, efficient economy. Because an economy is something that takes resources and transforms those resources in order to do something positive for the well-being of the society within it, which it serves. So the economy is purpose-driven, and that's the definition of sustainability. Because if you're purpose-driven, you're in service to the long-term well-being of all people and planet. So these things are all the same. So what's wrong? Because what we have is an economy that has been doing the exact opposite, driving unsustainability. At best, short-term desires for a few in the short term. And we are now facing, we are on the cliff edge of humanity. And it's not just climate change. And we know that it's biodiversity loss, it's a whole range of other things. So the issue is how we have organized the economy. Let's say we organize the market economy. And what have we done? There is one simple truth, which I think we all realize if we, if we really think about it. We have proxied well-being for everyone in the long term with financial income. And that is what we measure. That is what we govern for. At the national level, we govern GDP. We heard Rachel Reeves talk about it this morning. We are going to be a mission-led government. The mission is really important. It's about our purpose. And the, the one mission we have, to grow financial economic income. In the blind assumption that that is going to achieve long-term well-being for all people and planet, not only has that not been governed, but we haven't been governing whether we've been looking after the social and environmental systems that underpin our ability to create long-term well-being for all. So we've been governing financial capital as the means to create financial capital as the ends at all multiple layers of the system and not just in business, across all institutions. Institutions, universities, and we can go on. And so the reason why purpose won't go away is because until we solve sustainability, the pressures are going to get stronger. And we're going to be looking for a turnkey solution, something that doesn't just, because we don't have time to solve them. We have to mm. solve them systemically. And so I'll, I'll end by saying this isn't just fantasy. This is what I, in over 20 years, I can conclusively say this is what I think is happening. We're trying to born a birth, a market, a well-being economy, a well-being market economy, governed to the ends, operationalized by purpose-driven organizations, and driven fundamentally by the meaningful work that human beings unleashed to do their best work can do. And finally, to say, this isn't just nice words, we are actually quite far on in the journey. If we look around with, it, with that framework to help bring it all together, it's clear that that's what we are all trying to do. And if we can codify our consensus on this, we can move faster. And that's why I focused on standards building. So I spent five years leading the process to create the world's first consensus view on good governance of organizations that has purpose at the center, ISO 37000. It was signed off by 164 countries in the end. So if you want to lean on something as a starting point, please, ISO 37000, it's there. But more than that, last year, British Standards Institute published the first national standard in purpose-driven organizations. Again, not owned by anyone and therefore owned by all of us. And I was technical author and CMI were one of the expert contributors to that. That will move to ISO level next year and I'm going to be leading that process. That is the opportunity for the whole world all of you and everyone you know globally to get involved and say, what are we trying to bring about here? Because if we don't bring about purpose-driven organizations, meaningful work, delivering a well-being economy, we will lose the market economy and all its efficiencies and democratic aspects. And we will end up in a command and control system. Look what happened in the pandemic. Right, I, I didn't I need to digest all of that, but a great <laughs> first answer. Where does, uh, before I move on to you, Kevin, where does, I guess, when you think about culture, when you think about diversity, the importance of diversity of thought, decision-making, gender, you say we're quite far in the process. When you look at some of the data, and we heard about some of the data this morning, it doesn't feel like we're far enough, right? When you think about the data is going to take another three year, 300 years to close a gender pay gap, it feels like, gosh, why are we still having these conversations? How do we... What do we need to do to shift that narrative, right? And but where does because we don't get because we haven't got to the very heart. We can't just say it, businesses ought to act like this. Governments ought to act like that. We need to govern them to act like that. Society is the governing body. We outsource to government. Government, government companies, 
who then have a governing body that do that. Bang for buck, we need to be focusing on governance or get governance literature and drive purpose into governance. And because uh, if we don't go to our worldviews, that is the base, the base of any culture is worldviews. Yes. That gets manifested, doesn't it? It gets yes. manifested in hardware and software as decisions are made in context. We, we're dealing with the, the issues, but we need to get to the root cause. And I think that's the logic of the market economy. Well, speaking of government, it's a nice transition to you, Kevin. <laughs> um, Kevin, we had a fantastic prep call, and I was just I was just fascinated by your journey. Um, you talked to me about your journey not wanting to be the token of voice of disability within the House of Commons. You were determined not to be that. You ended up being that. Um, and so talk to us a little bit about that journey and the lessons you've learned and what what policies, structures, systems can support organizations to move to be more purpose-led? I know it's a loaded question. But. Okay, so shall I, shall I maybe address the second question yes. first, which is, um, just to recap, systems, policies, structures to support organizations to become purpose-led. And I began by uh, saying that um, there's no point in fact being purpose-led unless you've got really clear goals, clear objectives, and clear measurable outcomes. So you've got to have systems in place to measure the progress. And it's an age-old adage that what gets measured gets done, um, as we all know. So I chaired a commission recently for a major business organization that looked at harnessing diverse talent for business success. So it looked at what um, Viv described as the lived experience, importance of empathy, as an asset, as actually added value. And it looked at disability in the mainstream. So it looked at disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, male, female, gender balance in, in the workplace. And some of the recommendations that we made to business, and we also made separate similar ones to government. The government has yet to respond six months later, but that's another story. <laughs> um, where that you've got to have strong leadership behind those goals. And um, those goals need, need to be integrated. They need to be integral to your business strategy. If they're going to add value, why would you have them separate? So if you're going to have greater gender balance and not find that you're waiting X number of decades to achieve that, but you're making steady progress towards that goal within the next decade, then you've got to incorporate that within your senior management targets, including your board targets uh, and your chief exec and, and chair. Um, so you've also got to have clear values for recruiting people. So bringing in that diverse talent, you've got to review existing practices, um, particularly in recruitment, but also, crucially, for disabled people, career progression. So that they're not just left at entry level, as so often happens. And then you need to have staff networks of people with protected characteristics, and of course there is the vital intersectional piece, but you do need people with lived experience who can feed up to right to the top and challenge and push back. Um, and then I would say you need safe structures that facilitate cultural change. And crucially, we've already heard mention of sustainability. No point having change led and introduced and driven by a dynamic leader mm -hmm. if it's not sustainable. So it's got to become entrenched within the culture of the organisation. And as a Democrat, I push back really strongly against council culture. I think it's really important that we celebrate diversity, but equally we have to take people with us because otherwise, and I can see this happening in the laws, otherwise we face a backlash where politicians who don't buy into this ED&I agenda conflate everything together 
and say this is all what we oppose this should be blocked and we don't get progress if i may answer the second question yes. about my own background um i'll summarize it uh, in this way so i was an ordinary non-disabled person up until about the age of 24 i broke my legs a lot i spent my childhood in a hospital bed but it wasn't until i had life-saving neurosurgery um, at the age of 24 that i could discern a before and after moment and after that i became severely disabled i had to learn to talk again um, i had to pretty much um, restart my career um, and uh, only bloody mindedness got, <laughs> got me through that and, and the love and support of family and friends um, I don't want to take up too much yeah. time at this um, moment, but, but that's my story in a nutshell. Okay. So I think a couple of things that you said, so articulating clear values, the important to review practices, removing bias during yeah. recruitment process is, is really important. The staff network and creating um, th that safe structure that enables uh, men and women, all genders to thrive, I think are, are, are key to success. Uh, Maggie, let's move on to you because you've had um, a really interesting career in kind of corporate and tech and you moved on to startup scale up. Uh, what what made you uh, inspire you to move to a more purpose led business, but also give us a sense of as a leader, how can how can leaders uh, negotiate change while remaining purpose led and how do you balance those priorities? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Viv. And I think um, probably like a lot of us, um, two things really. Uh, number one, like I've got uh, young children, they're like uh, six and eight. And uh, also as a human, I got to a point where um, I come from a very kind of a socially engaged family in Ireland. <laughs> uh, my mom is a retired school principal at State Primary School. My father is a retired, uh, school, uh, sorry, retired uh, postmaster. They're extremely active in their community. And I come from a very rural place where community is just uh, deeply embedded in the way of life and the values that I've grown up with. Um, and so as I kind of got into experience in my career, my family started to hold me to account, we're only going to stop jolting around the world possibly <laughs> and start spending more of your time like in a, in a purposeful way. Um, so that was a bit a, a major motivation from point of view of how I wanted to spend my time. And some of the themes that we heard mentioned on stage today really resonated with me. And secondly, because I am first and foremost in a professional sense a businesswoman, uh, I recognize and see because of the privilege of the jobs that I've been in, the companies I've worked in, um, SAP sustainability business at one point rolled up to me, I could just see the value creation opportunity that is uh, in place. And um, I must agree with a lot of the points around how government and the role the government needs to play. I fundamentally believe in the agency of business. Mm -hmm. and I fundamentally believe that to drive any meaningful change at scale and, and including providing the dignity of work and the dignity of active economies, both from an economic sense and also some of the points, Victoria, that you touched on, on like from an inclusion perspective and just the, just the general dignity that comes from working with uh, people to do something and deliver an output. But I believe in the sense of agency around it. So those two things made me say, hmm, I'd love to woke up every day and say, well, you know, help and get the world to net zero in my, uh, in my own tiny way. Because it is also just a mathematical fact that if uh, the vast majority of companies in the world get to net zero and have an accurate uh, baseline, for their emissions management because carbon and the E within ESG is one of the few elements that is going to mm. really e is, um, uh, is going to trustworthy and um, uh, quantify, uh, can quantify in a very trustworthy way. And that carbon data and insight has value when used within the context of other business processes. And those two <coughs> things really made me decide to move into a sustainability company. And then maybe to address the larger part of your question, one of the really cool things uh, through the pandemic <laughs> Not the reason I've ever tried, I thought I heard myself say <laughs> during said pandemic, pivoting like I'm sure many of us, pivoting uh, businesses overnight to uh, uh, digital across 52 countries. But one of the really cool things that happened was the first time in my career where I had a, a data set of 19,000 people in Lex Unit. And it was the first time in certainly my career, I had five generations in 52 countries um, within that workforce and also. And SAP uh, tracked in a very meaningful way and also of all the data sets that we would expect in a modern company. Um, and a really interesting thing <coughs> was that 
the unifying thing that came across, regardless, regardless of country of origin, regardless of generation, regardless of ethnicity, of sexual orientation, of like disabilities, etc., etc., etc. The one unifying thing that every single segment reported was this this quest for more mission-driven and uh, companies and also uh, more purpose-driven work. Number one. Also, I know from my direct work with customers, I have the privilege to work with globally, and also the data sets that are uh, paid for, um, is that uh, this is fundamentally about competitive advantage. And that I actually do not know how somebody sitting in a business today, and particularly in a leadership position, I do not know how you lead today, let alone tomorrow, if you do not understand the business case for purpose, both the economic elements, but also all the more um, behavioral aspects as well. Yeah. And how you, if you understand, don't understand how to architect that and reflect it to your point, Kevin, in the right type of business outcome, share in, uh, articulated in the context of shareholder value, articulate, articulated in the context of cultural competitive advantage, articulated and reflected in a performance management system, <coughs> your behavioral expectations, and also the way in which the organization as an entity shares its insight in, in an appropriate way, obviously, in respect of uh, the competitive imperatives of the industry with the broader community. Because the future economy is circular. We see globally, uh, agnostic to industry, that that uh, business model is going through high rates of adoption. I'll give you lots of data points around this if anyone's <laughs> interested over a physical or virtual copy. Um, and also, uh, I'll close on this point, so we want to make sure you're from Caroline, and others in discussion as well. Oh, it's fine. But in terms of the consumers are marching with their wallets. And not just end consumers, also B two B customers. Because what you're seeing now within global as uh, global supply chains, we got front row seat at this at Normative because we're helping customers manage their scope one, two, and three emissions. Is that consumers are holding brands to account for the um, not just economic impact, but also um, the impact on the communities in which they're active on, and also the way in which they're managing carbon or not, and do they have an externally um, viable uh, commitment around net zero uh, that is an accurate bench line, benchmark and also is um, in compliance with not just the existing and emergent regulation but also scientific integrity and secondly employees are just not working for brands who do not have and they're not they're not, they're not stupid they can see what is greenwashing and what is not and they can see reflected in both the language because I think I'm a big believer that our language shapes our success how we speak about what we do, how we speak to each other, how we treat each other, how we deal with conflict. You know, we talked about psychological safety in some of the other conversations um, earlier. But employees, both existing and uh, future, they are looking at brands and assessing them in very different ways. So I pause there. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, uh, which is a great transition into Caroline. I was um, at an event last night and um, in, in the advertising industry and I was um, speaking to a very... Um, successful female CEO of a very big um, company, and I was asking her about, you know, what what is she doing from a gender diversity point of view? What are the gender inclusive strategies? And she said that I just don't have time. I've got so much pressure on commercial targets that I wish I had more bandwidth. She's fairly new into her role, right? To, to really look after, to to really focus on this. So I guess it'd be great, Caroline, to hear from you. Of what are the practical steps? managers, leaders uh, need to take to ensure they make the time and to ensure they are purpose-led? Well, first of all, um, I've been listening to it about purpose-led and it's all about net zero and, and uh, climate action, etc. But purpose-led can also mean about gender pay gap, yes. ethnicity yeah. pay gap, uh, disability rights, disability awareness, neurodiverse awareness. Um, because people sort of focus on one thing. Back in 2019, I was made a global goodwill ambassador for the advocation of um, the sustainable development goals. There are 17 sustainable development goals with 169 targets. There's so much to go at from a company's point of view, but they do not have to boil the ocean or eat the elephant whole. They can look at small sections to make a difference. Um, I don't know who that was that you spoke to. She says she has no time. She can delegate. Mm. She can delegate that task to other groups to actually look at what they can do to shift the dial. Mm -hmm. That's what we need is shifting the dial. The other thing I am is a wiki editor. I'm part of a campaign 
to um, reduce the content gender gap on Wikipedia. There are only 19% of pages on Wikipedia that are of women out of 29 million pages. Okay. Say that again. Okay. 19% of the 29 million pages on Wikipedia are of women. There is one country, may I say, principality, that has 50% 50, 50 representation on Wikipedia. Anyone know what that is? Sorry. Country? Country, say, principality. 50-50 percent pages on Wikipedia. 50 percent women, 50 percent men. I don't know. It has to be one of the Nordics. Sweden. No, I led you down the cold side. It's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Wales. Interesting. It's Wales. Yeah, it's Wales. We've moved the dial because I've been working on this for quite some time. What I'm trying to bring around is there are lots of things a company can look at from a purpose-led point of view, to move that dial mm. because we have so much to do, okay? Yes, we can talk about uh, climate and there's lots of data, et cetera, et cetera, but really I'm looking at from the soft skills. Might I add something Yes, in please. There? Yeah. Can I just finish? Oh, sorry, point? only if I thought you were finished. No. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I'm looking at this, at this from, the, from the soft skills point of view. If you're a manager and your CEO is passionate about a particular purpose-led uh, particular issue, and you're a manager and you have to sort of put that forward to the team. You have to basically lay that out for the team. It's all about education. Mm. I've just taught you something just now that you didn't know, right? Test me on it, check it out. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> but that's what they need to do is just basically work with their teams. Now, if that a particular team member goes, I don't care about gender content gap. They're not for that company. Yes, yes. They're not culturally right for that company and they need to move on. If you're trying to achieve a goal, you need the right team around you to achieve that goal. Okay? Anybody play sports? I don't. <laughs> you know if you want to get that trophy or win that tournament, you need the right team. Yeah. Okay? What did you say to me, John? Um, it was about not just recruiting the right people in the organisation, but designing them into the right teams that can match that purpose that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Victoria. <laughs> no, I was just going to support your, your point and maybe go one stage further around the fact that this is, and, and that, that's why having long-term well-being for all people and planet is that goal that we all, it's what I would describe as our meta purpose, that we can then say, you know, is this working? So that therefore brings in everything. When you're at an organizational level and you're making decisions, it's always about goals within parameters. And strategy is how do I fulfill the goal within the parameters? So if we're clear that the goal is long-term well-being for all, we are pretty can then start to think, oh, well, maybe this is a load of nonsense and we shouldn't be doing this. But equally, we need to be looking at everything that serves our ability to do that. And that's everything down. So when we look at ESG or SDGs, in many ways, they're a sense of where we need to raise ourselves up, up to. And I do genuinely, it depresses me a little bit listening to some of the leaders, even I might say politicians that we may have heard very recently, in around the understanding of how urgent and how critical these issues are. The yeah. breakdown of our social and environmental systems is not just about climate change. And it is not something you can kick into the long grass. And whilst we need to be empathetic to some companies and people, I, I get that, you know, yeah, tackle one or two things. We are seeing the birthing of a new compliance agenda where society says, you are not allowed to exist as an organization, you know, because organizations are society's innovation heartbeat, nerve center. They take our scarce, precious resources, and at the moment, they're asset stripping them. So they're saying is the new compliance agenda is whatever you do, even if you're not purpose driven, if you just want to make as much money as possible, at very minimum, prove to us that you're doing it within healthy thresholds of social and environmental systems. Pay people enough. Make sure that you're gender equal. Make sure that you're not, um, you're, you're going to be net zero within X period of time. Make sure you're not destroying ecosystems that are, uh, and water and, 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 and. And we can lay these out. You've got you to don't... keep an eye on it now because you see the thing is people and, the, and those people at a certain position are greedy. They're greedy. 
okay? And they just want money for the here and now. They don't see forward. They don't think about leaving a legacy. And that's what we've institutionalized, greed. So we have to move within this. And yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm going to take control of this panel again. (laughs) 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 Um, Because I'm sure I can go on for another hour. (laughs) But thank you. I love everything you're saying. And I agree. I feel like we're at a real tipping point, right? And and something we talk a lot about at Albright is this human energy crisis, right? We're not thinking enough about everyone's well-being. I want to open it up for all of you to have a discussion as well. Um, so the question I've got for you is, what does purpose-led mean in practice for those of us looking to build truly inclusive and sustainable organizations? Where have we seen this work well? And what are some of the pitfalls to avoid? So we were expecting to have tables where you can kind of discuss it amongst yourself, but we don't. But we do have microphones. So I'd love to hear um, your, your thoughts about it. Just over here. Yeah, my name is Abba Graham, and I uh, direct a lead for Stockport Race Equality Partnership, introduced to this space by the lovely Miss Whitehead. And, uh, <laughs> okay. You know what? Everybody on the panel has said something really conducive. But one of the things that the question posed is about how do you make your organization intentional. Mm -hmm. I think it's really crucial that we're intentional when we move the dial. The dial is Mm -hmm. so crucial to what we do next. It's really crucial. And how do we make it transformation? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's really, really important that we kind of use those two words and really drill into what it really means and how we then work with organizations, individuals, and people to do the right thing for the purpose of the community, the organization, and the journey forward. Uh, and that's what I see. Yeah, does anyone want to take Can that? I just do a time? Sorry, and I'll be very short, but it's because I forgot to give you the definition of purpose-driven organizations in the standard, and it kind of digs right into that. So I would say purpose is the route to being able to have this intentionality. The definition in PAS 808 that has consensus and now will be tested at global level, is that an organizational purpose, and you could say team, project, whatever, individual, whatever, is a reason to exist that is an optimal, not just any old thing, optimal strategic contribution to long-term well-being for all people and planet. And if you can rest with that very intentionally in all decisions you make, Is this the best thing that we could be doing as an organization that comes together to do something? So I I think it's a wonderful point. Intentionality is exactly right. Anyone else? I can talk to my specific uh, data points from um, normative. Uh, So I love the way you articulate it's about being intentional and being transformative because at normative, um, our mission is to make them and reduce all of the sustained, all of the economic sustainability impact of all economic activities on the planet. And uh, very specifically, how then we um, are intentional about that internally is that in support of that mission, when we were uh, developing our business strategy, including with our investors, uh, we were we were intentional about the type of investors we wanted to work with, those that also reflected our values, in terms of we believe that our investors and ourselves have to have common va- uh, common values. So we uh, lean towards evergreen funds, we lean to funds that like are looking at the same type of combination of yes financial returns, but understand that we will trade off short-term financial return in service to the more societal, broader impact. And also in terms of that our community activities, to your point on attempting to be trans- um, transformational, as Carol Ann's point, one of the um, interesting things in the, in the climate space is that, to be honest, not very well understood, because not least because of a lot of acronyms, mm. which is painful, I have to say. Um, that we've invested in, as well as our, alongside our commercial part of our portfolio, we also have um, a big investment in open source capability where we make um, a significant proportion of our software available to small to medium sized enterprises free of charge. So therefore they have got access to the same type of emissions management and measurement as the biggest companies that we focus on with our commercial offer within their value chains. And because from a community perspective, if we take one example of those supply chains, take the consumer staples supply chain. And in my past, I did a lot of work with the government in Ghana, and I'll never forget one of the ministers said to me, he said, 
But our company is at the end of two of the world's biggest supply chains, and my country has become a dumping ground for plastic. And unless people deliver through technology and change in behavior, and the way we quantify impact or the cost of economic progress, well, we need you to focus on traceability through the supply chain. So in terms of being intentional and reflecting that then in driving transformational outcomes, we've got a huge investment in that open source technology. We also have, if anyone wants to join our sustainability <laughs> community, where we're connecting um, uh, sustainability experts with other um, business and uh, social practitioners and making it entrepreneurship <coughs> free there, along with meetup events and such. And then to your point about um, being intentional about reflecting that through the way in which we um, uh, manage pay, we have no uh, gender pay gap and we have um, we are currently 46% female, including across product and engineering. I always call that out because it always wrecks my head when people uh, dress up the stats. Um, so it's, uh, and also for the first time ever, I found out yesterday, um, we uh, hit 50-50 gender parity in our global recruiting. Um, but um, to your point about being intentional, we're a small company. We're a Series B venture capital back company. And of course, there is both an ethical and a financial and fiduciary responsibility with accepting that money. So, in terms of, I think, one of the challenges you gave us there in preparation around balancing both purpose and then the need to you know, um, deliver commercial impact. I think I'll just share those data points. And we have our own sustainability report also available on our website if you want to see. Um, I think quite a good example of how a small company is attempting to be intentional and also drive transformational outcomes. Thanks. Um, I'm happy, of course, to talk about it. So Thank you. The SDG, the, so you, um, you, SDG 12, which is uh, responsible production and consumption. Good SDG. Mm. <laughs> I've got more. I've got more. <laughs> I'll give you the number, then I'll tell you what it is. So, so yeah, it's a responsible production and, and uh, production and consumption. So that's see, so that's what Ghana is saying about them being a dumping ground. That's got to be thought of. There's lots of we've said um, purpose washing. There's green washing. There's um, I talk about diversity dishonesty. I talked about it three weeks ago in Leicester. Um, I talked at the Big Ball Conversation for Senior Leader Summit about. Diversity, dishonesty, that whole lovely poster with all the people on there, someone with disability, someone who's brown, a bit browner, you know. And then when they actually get to the company, right, I turn up at the company and it's like mean girls, mm, don't sit with us because the culture hasn't filtered down. There's diversity, dishonesty. Um, so in in, re in relation to, um, to some of the companies, I keep going back. Whatever you think of the United Nations, look at the goals and look at the targets. The goals are 17, the targets are 169. Look at them and try and work with that. And also as well with certain companies, if you're at this level and you want to be at this level, there are B Corp companies out there that have gone through rigorous, rigorous um, uh, accreditation and assessment to get to a B Corp level. Look at them for mentoring. Mentoring is not just me to you or you to me. Mentoring is companies as well. How did they get there? What have they done mm. to get there? How do they treat their How do they treat their employees? You know, um, I can. I've turned up at a so-called purpose-led company to talk at their event, and arrived at reception, and some of us will resonate with that, and got told to go around another way. Only because they thought I was going to be serving the drinks. Mm. Right? That kind of attitude, okay, I'm calling it out, has not filtered down. Mr. and Mrs. in the in the boardroom, passionate about X, Y, and Z, they have not filtered it down. It's got to filter down to to John and Jane on reception. Yep. Right? When somebody comes through their doors. Absolutely. Um, I agree. It's something that I hear um, on talk a lot about is um, so much about behavior, right? And mm -hmm. I, we hear a lot, and I've heard this morning around behavior from senior leaders, but I really believe to drive that systemic change, it has to be across every level of the organization. It's a must that mm -hmm. it starts with leadership. But as you say, Callan, it has to filter down through every layer because mm -hmm. everyone has to use their voice, right? Everyone has to drive that change and we're all responsible for it. Mm -hmm. I love the point that you made around intentionality. And I think there's a lot of work we need to do to reframe leadership. You mentioned, Caroline, some leaders being greedy. 
right? And, and that's, that's also an important, how do we reframe uh, masculine leadership, right? That intentional leadership, ah. leading with empathy. Not is masculine. Masculine oh. traits. <laughs> no, 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 no. Tell me. No, because um, and women in the room know that, you know, what did Madeleine Albright say? There's yes. a special place in hell for women who don't support women. Yes. There are women who are greedy, who kick that ladder. Oh. <laughs> you know, they kick that ladder I away. Know. Albright is named after Madeleine Albright with an L in the middle, so we wouldn't get sued well, by her. But right. <laughs> so, so uh, yes, uh, it's not a masculine trait; it's a trait. It, it, so I say masculine trait, which uh, women can have or men can have, right? Yeah. So it's those traits of being empathetic, being intentional, which are a real competitive advantage, right? And we need to reframe what leadership means, because if you're leading with that intentionality, mm -hmm. then the rest, you know, the rest of the company will follow. Does anyone have, yes, that was a, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is really a burning, uh, issue I think within businesses so you have all these different aspects you've got the pillars you've got purpose we've talked about people we've talked about um, environment we've talked about the boards and cascading down which I absolutely love Caroline's point because it's it's on point yeah. <laughs> but could what I'd really like to know is um, I think the next question is how purpose is the foundation of a business or it should be for purpose-led and that would be through the company culture. We see about the person on reception doesn't really know, it hasn't cascaded down from the boardroom of what that culture means. And it maybe it comes to, I think governance is a very key point, actually, Victoria. But I think it's hand in hand with culture of how that's delivered. What would you advise are effective practices that are enablers for purpose across all the as aspects of purpose that Caroline mentioned um, to really have a fully purpose-driven organization. That, that is PAS 808. That, that's exactly what PAS 808 was designed to do. It has seven principles. Yeah. It goes, it, it, it's, it's in three areas. So ends, means and methods. So ends are the goals, means and methods are the parameters within which you're doing it, it goes into behaviors, it talks about full integration into the organization, it talks about culture, it talks about marketing, it talks about finance. So, and it's written, it's supposed to be there for organizations of all sizes. That said, it's quite an art to write something mm. that fits for all organizations. The, off, the invitation is, if you're working with particular size organizations, particular sector, write your own guidance for PAS 808, you know, something yeah. that bridges, that says, here's some examples of this clause in action, because it's not owned by anyone, it's owned by all of us. So I hope it's of use to you, and I'd love to hear feedback. Kevin, you have some thoughts? Um, maybe following on from what Victoria has said um, about the importance of, yes, having a clear big picture, you know, whether it's set by the UN and sustained into sustainable development goals, um, or, or any other organisation, it's very crucial that the person on reception, the individual, um, however mundane they may feel their role is in the organisation, knows where their contribution fits mm. within that yeah. big picture yeah, exactly. and within helping to achieve that big picture. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I think values mm. are so important. Uh, and clear internal communications, um, but also very clear goals uh, and, and culture, and how they contribute to the whole, um, so that the success of the organisation. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think was... I, I think as well, um, you know, sort of filtering it down. Here's the thing: health and safety. Okay, Jane and John on reception. No, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be trailing a wire right across the middle of reception mm. to clean reception. They know that's a health and safety issue. How do they know? How do they know? They've been told. They've been trained. Trained. Yeah. There you go. I'm not so simple, that. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but do I have time for one more question? Okay, do. Yeah. Go one more. Yeah, go on. Thank you. Right. Um, it's more of a statement, and I'd like a validation from yourselves, please. Um, 
from top management, from C-suit, having a vision and trying to put it through to embed it in everyone in the organization is good. However, personally, I believe that um, this, the middle management is actually the key in any organization because they filter up as well as they filter down. I do not see any focus on a middle management. All conferences, all different uh, organizations, they see, everyone seems to be um, hitting for the top yeah. in the hope that will make a change rather than hitting the bottom that will have an impact both ways. Yeah. Now, I just personally would like your opinion on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, oh, you guys can first hear the panelists. Go, for it. <laughs> go ahead, Kevin. Um, what goes back to part of the answer, um, which goes back to what I said at the outset, that you should have targets. Mm. But I mentioned senior management before. I think it should be about target setting at every level of management so that every team leader, however small the team, is judged on their contribution to the overall goals, uh, or rather to progress towards the overall goals and towards the organisational fulfillment. Yeah. I'm quite passionate about this point. Uh, again, to the point I said earlier, to drive true change, you need to support every layer of the organisation. And some of the latest data we just released a week ago shows that 38% of middle managers are look female are looking to leave their roles, right? They're not staying long enough. So what we're seeing is attrition at that, that top, right? When they get to the C, well, what are we doing to support them before they get to that C-suite level, right? So I think your, your point is, is, is really, really valid. There needs to be quite a lot of focus on that middle level because what I think worry about as well is that future pipeline of leadership, right? If, unless we're supporting them, we're not going to get that next generation of amazing leaders. And that's, I guess, our collective responsibility of leaders in this room to use our voice, to use our knowledge, our expertise, to lift others up, right, in the future. So we all need to be thinking about that layer of middle management. Absolutely. And CMI has done a lot on this, Absolutely. by the way. The frozen yeah. middle is something CMI is really passionate about. Yeah. So it's a shame. I think I'm out of time. Um, Everyone who's a time have you had a look at that? <laughs> You've got it in your bag, every the everyone economy. That that looks at the middle management as well. We also yeah. give you very quantified data data points from our customer base. And the the main community that all of our customers now are focusing on, exactly underpinning your assumption is that it's not the C suite. They're focusing on middle management. And together with our software, they're also procuring education packages and professional services. And also I think another reason for hope against think some of the general topics aside from just the E that I've been kind of focusing on with climate is that um, a lot of the systems integrators are forecasting that the next biggest outsourcing opportunity for business transformation is sustainability. So you know that they're within their boardrooms committing real money and forecasting and committed um, uh, business targets to as well. So we'll be releasing for leadership on this in a few months. Right. I'm just going to close now. I'll ask each member of the panel to just one thing everyone can, can go and take with them to the organization to help drive purpose. One thing, one thing we can do differently. Who's going to go first? I'm looking at you. No, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you need to think about it. Start with Victoria. Victoria, <laughs> one tip, one tool. Get involved in developing ISO, the ISO in purpose. And put, put, it, put, put your experience into something that the world can now then work. Thank you. Kevin? Everyone has a part to play, no matter how small their contribution. Thank you. I love that. Don't ignore the data and your responsibility to reflect it in the performance management systems of your <coughs> and tie it to the policy. <laughs> Take us home, Carol Ann. This is the final closing statement. <laughs> oh my God. People are your best asset. Lay in front of them the sustainable development goals. Let them read them and see which ones they want to pick up to move your organization forward. Love that. Great point, Anna. Thank you. A big round of applause.